Did you know that formaldehyde can enter a home through products like engineered wood, furniture, computers, carpeting, treated fabrics, hairspray, and cleaning materials? These potentially have harmful VOCs that can circulate through the indoor living space and affect the air that your clients breathe. The Air Renew drywall system is here to help ensure that your client's air is clean, thanks to CertainTeed uh, Air Renew. Indoor air quality is the first of its kind patent pending drywall that actively cleans the air by permanently removing formaldehyde. With airborne formaldehyde comes in contact with the board through the normal circulation, Air Renew drywall captures the formaldehyde and converts it into a safe inert compound, keeping it safe within the drywall. Air Renew drywall cuts, installs, and finishes just like conventional drywall and comes in type X moisture and mold resistant. The board looks, installs, finishes like standard drywall, and it's also available in M2 Tech moisture mold resistant solutions. Indoor air performance tests prove that Air Renew permanently removes formaldehyde. It has been validated by the ULE through their Environmental Claims Validation Program, and it works with most water-based acrylic and epoxy paints. Make sure to check them out. If you're a GHI member, uh, you may be able to get this at cost of drywall on your very first project. So let us know if you're interested. All right, so with that, I'm very excited to um, be starting out our second part, uh, part two, of Zero Made Easy um, with a focus during this session from the Department of Energy on the Zero Energy Ready Homes Program technical specifications in our first session that we did that's both available on our USGBC channel and YouTube channel. We discussed uh, the basics, the marketing, uh, and the value propositions of the DOE Zero Energy Ready Program. And in this one, we're going to be diving into um, some more specifications and technical details. Um, our instructor today is Jamie Lyons of Newport Partners Research and Consultants on Building Performance and Energy Efficient Design. He's the Technical Director for the US DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program, and in his role, he works with builders, raters, architects, and utilities to help them achieve solutions for designing, building, and selling zero energy ready homes. He holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and master's in environmental engineering, and he's a registered professional engineer in Maryland. So with that, I will hand it off to Jamie and take it away. Awesome, Brett. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for sharing part of your day with us today. I'm going to start forwarding through these. It looks like a continuing education slide here. Oh, and I apologize. There's a couple of things I just missed here. Um, this course <laughs> is approved for one hour in continuing education units um, with uh, Passive House, uh, CPHC, uh, and uh, you know who we are, so let's let's get moving forward from there. Okay. So, there you go. <laughs> I'll move this right on through there. Thanks, thanks again, Brad. Thanks everybody for joining us today. So, as you heard, uh, I have the opportunity and really the privilege to work with DOE on a zero energy ready homes program. I serve as technical director there. So that involves. Uh, helping people understand the specifications. You know, if you was going to put a label on a home, uh, a new home, uh, that is a zero energy ready home that meets DOE certification criteria, uh, there's a lot of specs that go behind that. So we help builders, designers, raters, and others understand sort of what goes into that. And we'll talk through, through uh, some of the options about how to go about complying with those specs. So if you took part in part one, you probably recognize this graphic. Uh, this is the six building blocks for zero. And if we, we work up from these six building blocks, it opens up a lot of benefits for builders in the form of market differentiation, as well as risk mitigation. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what Sam Rashman will talk about in, in building the business case and developing the marketing tools around this program. I sort of go the other way. I take these six building blocks, and to me, this is the foundation of the program, and these form sort of the building blocks of our specifications. So we'll walk through each one of these six building blocks over the next hour or so and explain what's really involved uh, in complying with each one of these. So a quick word about you know, what buildings and what home types can, uh, can be certified under DOE Zero Energy Ready Home. Uh, eligible building types include single-family detached and attached as well as uh, multifamily buildings that are five stories or less below grade as long as they have 
uh, HVAC at the dwelling level, so no central HVAC systems. And we do, uh, we do accept multifamily buildings with central hot water systems. And this is a re recent tweak to the program. It used to be that we accepted central hot water, but you had to have a large component of solar thermal uh, along with that central system. That's no longer the case. We can accept multifamily buildings that have central hot water systems uh, as long as they follow some specifications for efficient distribution of that hot water. That, that makes up the sort of pool of eligible building types. Uh, a high level, you know, so the 10,000 foot view of the specs is here. There's uh, a few main parts. We have our mandatory requirements. These are the must-haves. Uh, these are the, the things we really need to have if DOE is to label a given building or project as zero energy ready home. And then we have the target home spec. And I, this really boils down to the HERS index for a building or for a home. And we, we the rating software forms a, a twin of the design home. And then it dials in that twin to these certain design specs here, which are way too re small to read. But in climate zone five, uh, like Michigan, where bread is, uh, the furnace efficiency, efficiency would be 94 AFUE. So a given project might have a different furnace efficiency. This twin is dialed in to 94, and there's a whole bunch of other specs. And the software cranks all this out in the background to say, okay, to comply with the DOE zero energy ready home, uh, this given house needs to have a HERS value of 58 or less, something like that. It's not always 58. It will vary by the project and the location. Uh, so the target home is just that. It's a target. A design home has to equal or have a lower HERS index than that target home at the end of the end of the modeling process. So it's just a target. We can trade off uh, all of these different specifications that are defined by the target home. And then third, down here at the bottom, just like Energy Star, uh, there's a size adjustment factor. So if we have an especially large home, that is larger than the benchmark home size, the HERS index is ratcheted down a little bit lower in proportion to how much larger the home might be than the benchmark. So if I have a three bedroom, 10,000 square foot home, uh, I'm gonna need to meet a pretty aggressive HERS index for that home to qualify. If I have a three bedroom, 2,200 square foot home, uh, that HERS index will be much higher on the scale and easier to comply with. So those are the basics, the mandatory, the target, and the size adjustment factor. A lot of our uh, specs are based on your location uh, in the country, so we, we refer often to the IECC climate zone map. We'll have a few examples here today where we'll use climate zone five, but our spec speaks to all the different climate zones in the United States from one all the way up through, uh, I believe, eight in Alaska. So when when builders, raiders, designers first come along and they, they want to check out DOE Zero Energy Ready Home, uh, one of the initial questions is often, well, how, how efficient? How, how low or how high can my HERS score be in order to qualify? So what we find is you know, we've modeled a lot of baseline homes, uh, for examples, for our partners. And here's generally what you'll find. Our, our HERS scores for houses to qualify, going to be in the mid-50s, maybe the upper 50s, maybe the lower depending on the climate, depending on the size of the home. So this is sort of the general ballpark. And you can see here overlaid on the slide, so this gray box, the fact that there were close to 200,000 homes, 190,000 homes in 2015, this is based on ResNet data, uh, within, that were HERS rated, and the average HERS rating of those homes was 62. So we love to look at this and, and think that there's tens of thousands of homes that are achieving HERS indexes in the mid-50s, upper-50s, or lower. So if they look at the opportunity to add on the additional pieces uh, that we'll talk about for better indoor air quality, for better comfort, uh, to make a home renewable ready, if they look at those missing pieces, then they very quickly uh, could qualify that project as a zero energy ready home with DOE. Right along here. So we're going to start with that first building block. If you recall the six building blocks going along the bottom of that slide, we'll start with the optimized enclosure. Uh, what does that really mean? Uh, you know, sort of a bundle of practices we want to follow. We want to control air and thermal flow. So to get there, we need air, well air seal construction, 
good air barriers, insulation quantity and quality, and then good advanced windows to round out the envelope. So that airtight construction, here's what it looks like. For those of you familiar with flow door testing, these are ACH 50 values. And a couple things to point out. I hope you guys can see my mouse. I'm sort of using that as a pointer. Uh, these are so uh, targets, not mandatory hard, fast requirements, but targets. So if I am building in Grand Rapids or Chicago or many, many other places, I'm in climate zone five and I have a detached single family home, the target ACH50 for that project for purposes of zero energy ready home is two ACH50. I can actually have a blower door that's 2.3, 2.6, uh, or, or two or lower. It's just a target. So if I drift higher than this target, I need to make up for that somewhere else in the energy performance of the home. So my HERS index will hit that target that we talked about. If 2.0 is a, is a target, if we're an attached, like a townhouse, a condo, uh, some kind of multifamily, it's a little more lenient spec because DOE has seen a lot and done a lot of R&D. Uh, on the challenges of really getting good compartmentalization on multifamily. So our target for attached dwellings is a bit higher at three. And you can see by comparison, uh, the targets for zero ready are about one half targets for Energy Star homes. Uh, and we're you know, just a step ahead really of the, of the 2012 and 2015 IECC, which is at 3.0 in most of the U.S. And that, by the way, is a hard and fast pass fail uh, ACH50 requirements, so it's much more rigid in that sense. And then for those who are in the passive house uh, end of the uh, the industry, a much, much more rigorous target or a requirement of 0.6 ACH50. I'll often ask our builders, you know, we do this, we do trainings like this around the country to different builder groups, and I'll ask, is, you know, is it two, is it two and a half ACH50? You know, is that impossible? Is that moderately difficult? Is that easy? And I'll get a show of hands, and about three quarters of the room will will respond that it's easy or moderate uh, to achieve levels like a two or two and a half ACH50. So we think they're, they're pretty reasonable targets for for our partners to achieve. So just an example. Here's what we're trying to avoid: that black, uh, that those black streaks coming down. You're, you can probably guess this is an IR image is some negative pressure. I think this is a bathroom. So we're drawing some cold attic air down through that joint that we'll see here on the next slide, which is the joint between the top plate and the, the drywall. So just as an example of one of the checklist items that's part of our requirement, uh, it's an Energy Star Homes checklist. Uh, Energy Star is a prereq for DOE Zero Energy Ready. Everything in Energy Star is also part of Zero Energy Ready Homes. And within their radar field checklist, we simply call out the need to address that big crack that exists uh, at the top plate of the wall. And we can address that through any number of mechanisms with foam, still steel, or construction pieces. So that's just one quick example of how we get that good air sealing. Complete air barriers, again, we have these checklists, and again, we borrow this from Energy Star Homes. And the reason for the checklist really is to make sure we're doing all the things that matter and we're not going a la carte and achieving some good measures but missing others uh, because we don't have a checklist and no one's verifying it. So the checklists are a valuable tool to provide that quality assurance that we're air sealing all the key areas. Another quick example, uh, this is called out in the air barrier checklist. That house on the left there, uh, we, we really run the risk of a lot of uh, leakage from the garage over into the living area because of that open uh, floor, there's a uh, base between the floor trusses. Whereas on the right side, we've got good solid air blocking, which prevents migration of air from the garage over into the living space. That's both an energy issue as well as an uh, air quality issue there. Uh, insulation is that third component we talked about. The insulation levels required for DOE zero ready. Uh, we want this. We want the homes uh, labeled on this program to be visionary and using a code that represents the latest uh, rendition of the energy code. So we start with 2012, and you might scratch your head and say, that's, that's not all that new. Uh, hold that thought, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, so 2012 insulation level is sort of our starting point, and we can 
comply prescriptively, we can use a U factor for a given assembly, or this uh, third checkbox down here, the total UA calc is where 99% of our projects end up, where they use the modeling software to balance out the U value of the walls along with the area of the walls, and combine that with what they're doing in the attic, with what they're doing in the basement, uh, with what the windows are doing. And you can sort of optimize how you want to go about uh, designing your shell such that the total UA, when I take into account all the R values and all the areas of those, of those assemblies, it's at least as good as the UA of the home built to the 2012 IECC standard. Uh, it sounds complicated. For those of you who've done it, you know that the modeling software really just does the math for you, and it's very easy to optimize how you might want to go about uh, designing your building envelope. So there are plenty of uh, scenarios where a more advanced code is required. And, and I just mentioned you know, 2012 is not all all that current at this point, depending on where you are. So to deal with this and to make good on the value proposition that zero energy ready homes really are following the latest, most recent energy code, uh, we take we take a cue from Energy Star version 3.1, which is really doing the exact same thing. Most of the country is Energy Star 3.0, but if a state has adopted a more current advanced energy code, and the clock starts ticking, and roughly within about a year, that state is required to then use Energy Star version 3.1. So if we are in one of those states, and we'll show you the map on the next slide, if we're in one of these states that requires Energy Star 3.1, then DOE Zero Ready Home also requires 3.1 as opposed to 3.0. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. And, I'm sorry, I gotta use my pointer. And the envelope for that home has to meet 2015 IECC for the envelope insulation levels. If a given state does not require Energy Star 3.1, then so we're here on the right side, and it's sort of the business as usual. That project needs to comply with Energy Star 3.0, and we look at the 2012 IECC for the insulation levels. Here's how it plays out state by state. A lot of different colors here. I think I up to 18 or 19 different states, which are sort of in this pipeline, uh, the pipeline between Energy Star 3.0 and Energy Star 3.1. And this is available online at the Energy Star site if you want to uh, check, check given updates over time. Uh, so Brett and I were talking in Michigan, for example, they're now in the pipeline that projects permitted after April 1 of this year uh, would have to comply with Energy Star 3.1. And then those other items would kick in, like the 2015 IECC insulation level. Uh, so you can see if your given state is in this pipeline and, and what the effective date might look like in that case. So what does this all mean? Uh, it, it's a little anticlimactic, actually. Uh, we'll start with Energy Star 3.1. That essentially makes the, the HERS value more stringent uh, than 3.0. Uh, and the good news for our builder partners with Zero Energy Ready Homes is if you're doing projects and you're already in the mid-50s to meet Zero Energy Ready Home, by and large, that same HERS index will meet energy, uh, version 3.1. So there's really little or no additional burden for meeting 3.1. It's very easy to check that within the rating software. Just, just like you would check to see if a project complies with Energy Star 3.0, you can check compliance against 3.1. So it, it takes a matter of seconds to see if your zero energy ready home project, you're going to be able to check the box for 3.1 compliance. So that uh, is generally not any additional burden or, and no additional steps are required to meet 3.1. What about the 2015 envelope levels for, for insulation? Again, uh, for those of you who might be code geeks like myself, uh, 2012 and 2015 insulation levels changed very, very little. And in fact, uh, as you see here, uh, in a very minor way, the 2015 code is just a hair less stringent in terms of the U factor for uh, frame walls than the 2012 was. So sort of the short story is eating a 2015 envelope criteria won't impose any additional burden for zero energy ready homes. Uh, in most or all cases. So it seems like a lot of uh, you know, gymnastics we're going through here, but we do want to continue to make good on that promise that 
labeled homes under this program are meeting the latest energy codes. And so we're just in the, in the initial stages of starting to look at integration of 2018 IECC because that will soon be published and states uh, like Maryland and a few others will adopt it shortly at, thereafter. So just a, a quick visual here. You now here's what the R value requirements look like in both 2012 and 2015 installation levels. Uh, so climate zones 4 and 5 are shown here. Uh, pretty typical, R49 ceilings, you know, the walls are going to be 2 by 6 at R20 or 13 plus 5 kind of construction. Uh, so again, we'll ask roomfuls of builders, architects, raters, you know, are these heroic levels to reach or they can do this cost effectively? And again, uh, the majority of our, of our uh, attendees, uh, you know, confirm that they can do these things and in most cases they already are insulating to these levels. Okay, uh, pause for a quick question from the chat. Are the specs available for download on the Zero Energy Ready Home website? Absolutely. Uh, the website uh, is listed on our last slide with some contact info. Uh, you can just Google it or it's pretty easy to remember, buildings.energy.gov slash zero. Uh, but again, you can, we'll get to that towards the end here. Uh, wall, wall systems. We, we want to have high R value walls. So we're all, often asked, what do you use? What, what, what are your builders using in their project? And it's great because, the, you know, builder preference and regional practices and their relationship with trades and several other factors end up meaning we see a, a pretty wide spectrum of assemblies being used. So we'll tick through some of the more common ones here over the next five or six slides. Uh, start with the basic, just, you know, advanced framing. So we're lowering that framing factor down to 12, 15% in a two by six assembly. It gives us a U factor somewhere 0 0.05, 0 0.06. Uh, and then, you know, just some of the issues with design and installation. The R19 bat is too thick, uh, so it's compressed, and you end up with something lower, like an R17. If instead our builders would use an R21, it's optimized for that 2 by 6 cavity. It actually fits, so they get, uh, they get more full R value of that R21. Uh, sometimes builders will use blown in. Uh, in these assemblies or even spray foam or sometimes hybrid, uh, you know, with spray foam and some kind of bat and flat, uh, bat and flash system. So that, that's often used. Uh, next, next iteration would be something like a 13 plus 5 wall and a 2 by 6 with our 13, maybe our 15 with a layer of exterior foam in the exterior. It might be half inch up to an inch. So it might be something like a 13 plus 5. Uh, we get a complete thermal break here where we, you know, we were not getting that in the last assembly. Uh, if we do have any condensation on the inside face of that exterior foam, it's not in the cavity, so that's, that's a good thing for durability. A lot of manufacturers of the foam boards are, are testing and marketing the ability of that foam board to serve as a WRB, so it can act as a step saver. And then the cladding issues are there, so you need to do your homework depending on what cladding you're using and see what requirements uh, come into play for, for fastening that cladding through the exterior foam. That's, those are some of the uh, variables to consider with that system. This next one, uh, the 2 by 6 with staggered studs. Uh, we're seeing an increasing number of our, of our builder partners in, I'd say, mixed and cold climates using this type of assembly. So it's a 2 by 6 plate there that you see down, down here. And then there's two by four studs, but they're staggered. You have an exterior facing and then an interior facing. It goes on that on that basis down the wall at 24 inch spacing between this exterior and the next exterior, which would be out of the picture. So a big reduction in the thermal bridging. Uh, the plates are still going to bridge, but the studs don't carry from the inside to the outside, so we're able to block the thermal bridging through the studs. And based on our partners' uh, experience and their analysis, we're, we're hearing that this is cost competitive with traditional 2 by 6 framing. Another interesting option. SIPs, uh, we have a number of our partners that use SIPs. They're sort of, you know, they, they've gone up that learning curve to construct with SIPs. Uh, the U factor here, because we have such a, 
a enhanced ability to decrease the thermal uh, any thermal breaks, Q factor is down around 0.03, so uh, quite a bit lower than that first wall we saw, which was a 0.05 to 0.06 Q factor. Very little framing factor in the single digits, but again, there's a learning curve, and these panels are going to be very straight and true. Uh, so you want to make sure the foundation is equally straight and true so uh, you don't have corrections which are hard to implement in the field. Oops, jumped on there, sorry. Uh, ICFs, we have a few builders uh, using this, uh, this kind of system. Again, there's a learning curve. It's a different style of construction. Uh, a few of the builders that use this for all their projects really optimize their design, so ICFs. Uh, they, can, they can optimize how productive it is to use ICS given the layout of their of their floor plans and their exterior walls. Complete thermal break. Again, the foundation has to be very level. Uh, there can be a longer construction time, although we are starting to see a few builders try to work on that by using panels of ICS instead of sort of the block by block uh, construction process. Really good in terms of termite resistance and disaster resistance. Uh, they do come in most cases with uh, some kind of cost premium compared to uh, traditional wood framing. And then the, uh, the last one here is the double wall. I'd say we're mostly seeing this in colder climates, climate zones five or colder. So what we're doing here is we have an extra wide top plate uh, and then two separate frame walls uh, underneath that plate. So it allows us to really fill a wide expanse of insulation, oftentimes loose fill, into this extra thick wall wall cavity. Again, U factor is quite low around that 0 0.03, 0 0.034 uh, level. Uh, here, this, this is sort of a sort of a you know real interesting application for building scientists to look at. That you know, we're, we're almost going to be a victim of our own success here. If we're building in, in Denver, let's say. And we have R26 between the interior and the exterior, and it's very cold out. The inside face of the OXC is going to be very, very cold. It's basically going to be the right at outdoor conditions are very close because there's no heat forming it from the inside. And you really have to look if there's any moisture in the indoor air that's getting through by air leakage or vapor diffusion, there's going to be condensation mist. Uh, that exact same wall might look and form a little bit different if we're in New England, for example, based on the, the prevailing humidity conditions. So the takeaways here really are, for our builders that are using this, they've, they've employed some kind of hydrothermal modeling, either in-house or with third parties, to really make sure that this wall is going to work for them, uh, given its sensitivity to moisture. In some cases, uh, builders are moving to vapor open design, so this exterior sheathing is going to be more air, uh, vapor permeable, so any moisture that does form can escape to the outdoors, so it's a little more forgiving. Just a quick run through of, of uh, some of the most common wall systems that we see our partners using. Jumping over to roofs. Uh, again, we're looking for higher R values in those roof systems, so uh, we need to do things like have the high heel truss so we can get an adequate R value out of the, uh, the top plate of the walls. I'd say it, you know, most of our partners still have ventilated attics and they, they insulate on the flat. Uh, there is a contingent of design and builders that are using the unvented attic assembly. And there's, again, there's some building science to think about with this type of an assembly. So this has been recognized in the IRC, I, I think, going back two or three cycles. So it's, not necessarily new, and the IRC calls out a few different ways of how we can insulate and at the same time reduce uh, the risk of moisture problems. So one of those methods is to use an air impermeable insulation down here uh, underneath the roof deck. And we want it to be air impermeable so air can't sneak up and flow around the insulation or through it and find a nice cold surface here and create condensation. So that's one thing we need to watch for. The other is we need at least a minimum R value of this layer of insulation uh, because if it's too thin, then this lower surface, the bottom end of that yellow there, uh, it'll get too cold during the winter and indoor air might have enough humidity to start uh, condensing out and creating a moisture problem there. So how much insulation is needed? 
Uh, again, that's called out in the code. Uh, this is in the IRC. And if we're in climate zone five, we need that, that layer of insulation, that air impermeable insulation. Has to be at least R20 uh, for the purpose of moisture control. Uh, but if we take a second look, we need at least R49 in the attic uh, just for purposes of meeting the energy code. So there's two things going on. You have one layer, one insulation spec for the moisture, and a second insulation spec for thermal performance. So our builders that are looking at this, you can see as we get in the colder and colder climate, you need more and more insulation just to control that moisture. Uh, so if, you know, if it's too cold, sometimes this is not insulating underneath the roof deck with that air impermeable insulation is not the most effective way to go. Uh, another option shown here is to insulate above the roof deck, uh, and then we're keeping the roof deck at that point warm enough so we're not going to have a, a condensation risk. And because of that, we can now use an air permeable insulation underneath the roof deck. So that's another option. Uh, if we're doing that, though, this also has to be at least R20 if we're in climate zone 5 based on this table. So we're still having to protect uh, the first surface that indoor air could see. We have to keep it above the dew point temp. So those are some of the considerations of, of the unvented attic, uh, but we, you know, we do have a good number of builders looking at that assembly type. Uh, and it opens up some other possibilities, like putting the ducts and the roof back up in the attic. Hey, um, Jamie, are, are builders having issues with installed thicker than one inch rigid insulation on the exterior of two by six stud walls? What kind of issues are, are you alluding to, Brett? I will let the person who asked that question uh, elaborate and, and, and perhaps we can move on mm -hmm. to the next one while they do that. Um, so greater than one inch often will trigger a second set of cladding attachment requirements for manufacturers. Um, I know with some fiber cement manufacturers, for example, if you're over one inch, uh, they, it triggers the, the requirement to the rain screen, um, ventilated design. And, it's and it looks like, it looks like they were looking at uh, mainly window installation on that question. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard a whole lot about that. Um, it's the window in installer or the window insulation or manufacturers uh, often will have specs that could deal with that, but in the absence of that, uh, yeah, that could be an issue for a builder to navigate. So I, I, I don't know of a whole lot of our builders that are going above an inch. I think once they're doing that, uh, they're considering, you know, if they're two by four plus an inch, They'll migrate to two by six plus an inch uh, for more R value, or they might do that staggered stud design. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot going past that one inch of the exterior foam. Uh, Great, thanks. In, sure, good question. Thank you. Next, next, uh, and final component of the of the envelope is uh, the windows. So windows obviously are important. They sort of represent a, uh, a short in our thermal envelope, so we want to make them as effective as possible. So really the spec is, is fairly basic in this area. It requires energy star windows that meet the U values and solar heat gains that you see here. Uh, there are a couple important footnotes and exceptions. We can we can do an area weighting of, of the entire glazing package uh, so you can balance out a few non-conforming windows if the overall package uh, area weighted values meet the U's and the solar heat gains that we see here. And then there's also allowances for passive solar design. Uh, they can be exempted out of these factors if, if the design is using a, a passive solar uh, concept. Uh, so that, that's the envelope. The second building block uh, that we want to talk about is the comfort. Uh, optimized comfort is what we call it. With most of these buildings, you know, compared to a design for the same plan of, of seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, the loads now you know, might be 50%, 50, 70% lower. 
So it does take a lot of attention to make sure that we're still addressing comfort adequately uh, with heating, cooling, uh, moisture control, balancing of the air, filtration, all those things. Uh, so it falls really into two buckets, HVAC installation and an optimized duct system. So the HVAC installation, uh, again, we, we embed this as part of the Energy Star Homes program. Uh, essentially, you know, it has, it has some real basic concepts in there which are verified now because it's part of this checklist. So here, here's the basic idea that air is going to follow the, the path of uh, least resistance. So on the left side here, uh, this design is going to work great if room A and room B have the same kind of load. Uh, over here on the right side, you know, we can see that the, the pressure uh, towards the airflow is different now, and the airflow responds accordingly. So again, this, this is fine as long as we're doing this on purpose and not by accident. Otherwise, we'll have you know, comfort issues quickly arise. So, you know, to, to put it in a little more visual terms, here's what we're trying to avoid. And this is uh, a duct system, believe it or not, in an actual house. You guys have probably seen examples of this on your own. And, you know, oftentimes we try to put, put building science phenomena in terms that a consumer gets quickly. So I mean, maybe this is how we explain on the right, on the left side, this is how we explain it to somebody uh, who's not an HVAC technician, but they still understand you want to get comfort to where you need it and not have it all tied up. So, again, to complete the example, in the Energy Start Radar Field Checklist, we have this basic provision of good duct installation. Verify that the ducts are balanced, insulated, tight, and installed without major defects. To optimize the duct system, uh, you know, previously we had called this ducts must be located in condition state. We to change the, the wording on it because we have a lot of uh, allowable approaches, that, as we'll see here in a second, that the ducts are, are sort of in between unconditioned space and conditioned space, but they're pretty well insulated and they're very well air sealed. So we call that optimized duct location. And there's a lot of good reasons for this, energy, air quality, comfort, durability. Our spec has a few exceptions that we allow. Uh, a little bit of duct up to 10 feet can leave the thermal envelope. Jump ducts can go through an attic as long as they're fully air sealed. And we have seen an increasing number of projects go with ductless systems. And one of the benefits there, obviously, is you don't have to worry about where to put the duct. So again, the approaches that we see our builders using, we'll tick through five or six examples on the next slide. Uh, this, this one's been around for ages, right, the drop ceiling. Uh, when we do this, today we, we want to take a, a close look at a few of the details, like the the throw out of this register here, I want to make sure that's designed and that register is spec such that we have enough throw from that red register to get the airflow out to the exterior of the room so we get good mixing. Uh, that's important. Uh, also, we we want to make sure this is truly an air sealed bulkhead. Uh, I've, I've poked my head into these in existing buildings and you can actually see up to up into the attic. So all the time and trouble and effort to create this bulk is really wasted because all the leakage is just going right up the outdoors. Uh, there could be some thermal gain from a hot attic. So you really want to make sure this, this bulkhead is air sealed and insulated and isolated from condition space. This, uh, this one, the modified attic truss, kind of flips that last one around. Now we redesign our trusses such that we create a little pocket which can then hold the ductwork. So it's extending the condition space up into this zone where the truss framing has allowed us to create this pocket. Uh, but the same ideas apply. We really need to make sure that this space is, is truly uh, separated from this hot attic. So we need a good air seal on the sides and the top, and we need the insulation to be on the sides and the top. And on this vertical piece right here, uh, often that'll mean some kind of mechanical fastening. Uh, something to hold that insulation in place over time so it doesn't flop over. Uh, design integration is important here because we can't make this pocket all that wide. It gets increasingly difficult for the truss. So generally it's going to be a more narrow pocket and we're going to drop 
our supplies uh, directly down out of his pocket. So it's not better fit for more narrow plans. And I think the next slide we have an example from a habitat project in Florida where they did just this. You can see their uh, their truss design here on the upper right, where really they just create a very narrow pocket uh, where they they run this trunk and then they have uh, supply registers dropping down out of that trunk into the living space. And you can imagine this is, this is kind of a nice uh, design option when you're building slab on grade and you don't have the benefit of a basement not to locate ductwork. Uh, ducts between floors, I, I, I like this approach a lot. I've been involved in projects going back years where we were doing duct designs like this. 10 or 15 years ago, the ducts were way larger. And the reason they were so much larger is because the building load was so much larger. And it became a real challenge to have a an open web truss like this that allowed a, a 10 inch or an eight inch duct to, to go perpendicular through it. But now that those ducts might be six inches in size because the loads are lower and we're carrying less there. So it, it's a nice kind of harmony between lower loads and, and being able to wrap the ducts more easily. Uh, if we're using this kind of truss, this is a very cost-effective approach. Uh, well, two-story plans will end up dropping down supplies onto the first floor and flying upward into the second floor in most cases. Uh, so depending on your climate, they, that might be acceptable or it might be more of a challenge. Unvented crawls or conditioned basements certainly work. Again, here's another uh, habitat project. This is a, a ducted mini-split located in a condition crawl space in North Carolina. So if we're, if that's our foundation type, it gives, gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in locating both the unit down there as well as the duct work and then running, running the ducts to their necessary location. Uh, we talked a little bit a minute ago about unvented attics and you know, one of the one of the sort of tangent tangential benefits of, of going with the unvented attic is now we have a space for our ducts as well as for our equipment. And that's, a, that's an important consideration. We want the equipment as well as the duct work to be in temperate uh, condition spaces, not located in unconditioned spaces. Uh, if we're using this unvented attic design, there's a lot of uh, literature that on how to navigate the code requirements for the thermal barrier and the ignition barrier to cover up that spray foam. Uh, so we won't go into that, but Building America and its website, the Building America Solution Center, has some very good guidance on how to navigate these requirements. And the second point is also important, that if, if you're doing load caps on a building and all of a sudden you've added an unvented attic, you're adding a lot of volume. You're increasing the surface area of the building shell because it's no longer on the flat, it's, it's the, the roof ridge. So it generally will increase the heating, cooling load, it'll affect your HVAC sizing. That's sort of one of those give and take factors uh, to take into account. Uh, this one is a little different, stuff in a vented attic. I mentioned a minute ago that we have kind of these hybrid prescriptive solutions for where the ducts can go under this program. This is one of them. So this is only applicable to dry climates. That's going to be the western half of the U.S. climate zone B, as in boy, on that climate zone map that we saw. So what's going on here is we have a really well air sealed uh, duct. It's sealed to three CFM 25 or lower for every 100 square feet floor area, and that's leakage to outdoors. So if you're familiar with duct leakage uh, terminology, that's a well air sealed duct. We start there, and then it's insulated to at least an R8, and then it's buried under the attic loose fill to at least a coverage of three and a half inches above that top surface of the duct. So once we do all those things, Building America has done field testing and thermal modeling on this, and it shows some pretty interesting things. There's, there's very little heat loss down here going downward through the duct because there's not a huge driver. It's 70 inside, and it might be 55 inside that duct. You don't have a huge delta T. And laterally, you have sort of this ocean of insulation to the side. You don't have a lot of thermal flux laterally. And what, what you do have is you do have some thermal flux upward out of the duct, uh, but it, it's 
it's a lot better than the duct losing uh, losing thermal energy in all directions. So based on all the work DOE's done, this, this type of assembly is within a few percent of the duct being completely in conditioned space in terms of the uh, the energy performance. So we recognize this in the Zero Ready program as as a uh, acceptable method for duct location. And then a, a modification of that, because that was only dry climates, this is what we can do for humid climates. It's almost the same thing, but what we've done is let the uh, yellow layer, we've added a little cocoon of spray foam, closed cell spray foam. And what that does, it's going to be air impermeable, it's going to be vapor impermeable. So it's going to it's going to bring the surface temp right here up above dew point uh, with getting at least an inch and a half of the closed cell spray foam. And also creates a vapor barrier so we don't have humidity finding its way in and creating sort of this chronic sweating condition on the duct. So this is what the this approach looks like for humid uh, climates. That's zone A on the climate zone map, so most of the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, it's still an R8 duct, still that same air leakage requirement. Uh, we add the inch and a half of closed cell spray foam, and now we only need to bury the insulation, uh, bury the duct by two inches. We can do a little bit less on the burying side because we've added that closed cell spray foam. So these are spelled out uh, item by item in our specs. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about them. So our third building block, well, let me pause, see if there's any questions here. Um, Jamie, there was a specific question about the uh, DOE, um, or rather the uh, Energy Star credentialed HVAC contractor, and just the concern about um, you know them being required or people being able to find them. Um, have you found that, uh, I guess, that more contractors have been taking that on and that uh, there's been some value to, to working with a contractor with that credential? We, we have an ongoing dialogue with the Energy Star Homes team, and oftentimes we will talk about that. If, if you're involved in a zero energy ready home project and you're unable to access a QA certified HVAC contractor, please do reach out and contact us at, at the DOE Zero Ready program. We might have a recommendation for a contractor or we might be able to consider an exception um, for that program depending on the circumstances. Uh, a, another sort of observation on that is we recently posted a bulletin on the DOE website uh, just explaining clearly the scenarios when a QA certified contractor is not required and if Many of your participants probably know this already, but if if you're using uh, like a mini split system or a boiler based system, uh, there's exceptions within the Energy Star Homes that uh, allow that project not to require the use of the QA certified HVAC contractor. Uh, and in this bulletin, we also spell out that that's true even if it's a ducted mini split system. So uh, that bulletin is now posted on our website and available, and I can follow up with anybody who's interested in, for more details on that. And I think piggybacking off of that to a, another question that came in, I think this is what he was referring to is, um, you know, verifying the HVAC in the design stage. I mean, that's something that that um, HVAC contractor and the rater would ideally be doing, correct? That's right. That's right. And that would fall in terms of, sort of the program building block that would be the HVAC uh, the HVAC design report. So the, the HVAC designer does that, and the, and the verifier or rater uh, reviews that. Great, thanks. Good question. And, and we do hear quite often about the HVAC contractor being a a, uh, a big sort of stumbling block for some projects, so. If you find yourself in that position, please let us know, and we'll try to work uh, and find a solution for you. Uh, water protection, this is a pretty basic building block again, but it, it's critical because we're not building seven, eight, nine ACH 50 houses now. We're building, uh, you know, a third of that level. And so a, you know, I'm sure many of you have worked on existing homes and you take off siding or you place windows and you see water damage. It's been chronically there for years, but it's 
manage to dry out. Uh, it's much more difficult in a 3HH50 home with highly insulated walls for that to happen. So moisture protection is more important uh, now than, than ever. So again, the basic concept is to shed bulk water down uh, and away from the, the building enclosure. Great example, here's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, typical construction might miss this detail, and we like to have these checklists, as I mentioned, make sure we're doing the things that matter so we don't get this chronic uh, water intrusion down that down that wall where it uh, meets the, uh, the adjacent roof. So the checklist item here, again, is part of the water management checklist out of the energy store program, just to use step and kick out flashing. Here you can see a couple of details on that, what it looks like. Uh, next building block is the components. So these are the white goods, the fans, uh, water heating. And as we ratchet it down, heating and cooling so substantially, you know, we have a much smaller pie of energy use. But the slice of that pie uh, for appliances and miscellaneous loads is a bigger slice now. Uh, heating and cooling are getting smaller. And so we, we do want to look hard at the, the components to make sure we, we're doing things that are reasonable and make sense to, to reduce the overall energy budget for the home such that it's zero energy ready and it's within striking distance of zero if renewables were added. So what the program actually requires is uh, simply Energy Star certified appliances where the builder is supplying that appliance, like a refrigerator, a dishwasher. Uh, bathroom fans and ceiling fans are Energy Star certified. That's the second point. I, I personally really like this requirement because it, it also makes those fans quiet. Uh, Energy Star criteria for bath fans it's not just the energy uh, efficiency of the fan, it's also the noise rating in the zone. So you have a pretty good shot at a fan that's quiet and the residents may use it, um, which is really the whole point. So uh, quiet and efficient fans is a good thing. Lighting, minimum 80% of the fixtures or lamps uh, will be high efficiency energy star lighting. And that could be CFL or it could be LED. And then hot water distribution. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. We want an efficient plumbing layout for our hot water so it's not wasting energy as well as water. So this is what it means essentially that our hot water distribution system between the hot water source and that furthest fixture, we're not storing any more than a half gallon of water in between the two in the piping. And then when I go out to that furthest fixture, and I turn it on, by the time I've collected 0.6 gallons in a bucket, I've seen the water temp coming out of that fixture increase by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, third point, there are a lot of research systems out there. And for, for our program, we want demand-based research. It's a, a, a good number of systems out there are based only on a timer or only on a temp sensor. And there's no real indicator for demand. So uh, you, you might be out of town for a week, and that timer is still going to actuate the system to run. So it's going to pump energy, it's going to circulate hot water, it's going to trigger more water heating usage. So uh, research systems under this program have to be demand-based, and they, they can't just be based on a timer or just based on a temp sensor. And then in terms of uh, central systems, I mentioned this at the outset, uh, central systems in multifamily are permitted. Uh, they have to use an on-demand research system that's based on some kind of demand indicator. It could be a flow indicator in the, in the hot water piping. Demand as well as temp. So we want to pump in these demand systems to know that, yes, there's a demand, and yes, the loop temp is below a threshold. If those are both true, then the demand uh, will kick in and will circulate hot water through the loop. What's different about our multifamily requirements is we don't have this, this limit of 0.5 gallons uh, stored volume at this time. We're trying to get our head around you know, what's a, a reasonable number to use in multifamily. We're, we're not quite there yet. So there's no, we don't have this 0.5 gallon uh, stored volume limit for central systems at this point in time. And as I mentioned, there's no solar required. Uh, up till now, Energy Star Homes and Zero Energy Ready Home had required central systems to have a large solar thermal uh, helping to provide hot water if you're using a central system. 
for the zero ready program, we waive that or we no longer have that requirement. So three of the basic ways we get to these efficient hot water systems that our builders use. You know, one is just basic. It, it flows out of the floor plan with consolidated the wet areas. So we have a core plumbing layout where everything's kind of grouped. We have short uh, plumbing runs, and we don't have a lot of hot water between the, the heater and the fixtures. That's a pretty basic one. Obviously, it's floor plan dependent. Second one is the manifold home run based system. So we have smaller diameter, typically half inch home runs going out to the fixtures. Uh, because it's smaller diameter, uh, we can, we're not storing a lot of hot water, so we, we're able to uh, have a little more flexibility in the floor plan just using manifold home run system to supply all the hot water fixtures. We have a, quite a few partners use that system. And then the, the other major category is the demand pumping system that I mentioned. So we have things like uh, the remote control, you know, the push button to actuate the pump. Uh, we also accept occupancy sensors in the bathroom. And we also accept uh, smart or adaptive scheduling systems. They're sort of like the Nest thermostat, but it's for hot water. So they learn your profile. They, they, they know that Monday through Friday, uh, quite often someone takes a shower at 6 a.m. So they, that pump primes the loop according to that schedule. If you're using a system like that, our program uh, recognizes that you don't, you're not required to put in a, a push button remote uh, to, to trigger uh, research. And there's adaptive scheduling systems. They're found both in tankless units where the pump is integrated into the tank, the tankless uh, box, uh, and they're also found in some of the external pumps. Um, there's a few ways to, to get at that technology. I have to hustle here a little bit. Uh, the hot water estimating tool, this is an Energy Star Excel-based spreadsheet. Uh, we're posting it on our site, I believe, within the next few days. But it's also available through WaterSense. It lets you just crank out some numbers using um, this worksheet to understand if you're using a home run or using uh, a branch, trunk and branch, or even a research, how much water is stored in your system uh, given its uh, pipe sizing and its layout. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at this if you're trying to understand how your system might fare. Uh, indoor air quality. Uh, this is really a critical area, so I'm going to hustle just a bit, but I, I do want to pause here. We have these really well air sealed homes, and a number of our builders are really aggressive and, and successful in marketing not just the efficiency of the home, but the comfort and the healthfulness of the home. Uh, so it's important that our spec really provide a complete system for indoor air quality. And we do. Uh, we start with Energy Star Homes, which gets us a pretty good foundation. And then we round that out uh, with Indoor Air Plus. So zero energy ready homes, uh, by default, they're Energy Star Homes. And they're also uh, certified with the IAP pr program, the Indoor Air Plus program. If you see here, that gets us a few really critical additional building blocks. Uh, radon mitigation if we're in zone one, uh, pest management, uh, low emission materials, and a few additional measures in those other areas. It's very critical that we're doing a complete system, you know, and our marketing materials say as much. You know, these are the recommendations from the, the nation's leading experts in indoor air quality. This is what they would recommend for new home construction. So radon, I'll, I'll cover this quickly. If you're in radon zone one, some of the dark red counties, and we see, you know, they're kind of sprinkled throughout the U.S. If your project is in one of those sites, then passive radon construction techniques are required. Basically, we're air sealing the foundation from the living space or putting in a passive stack. No fan required, but we are, uh, we are asking that electrical supply be somewhere located near that stack, so it's not too difficult to install a fan later on if needed. And radon test kits are not required. Uh, in a prior version of IAP, they had been required. Pets, this is code minimum. But again, we want to make sure it's actually being done and someone's checking on it. It's on the screen so we don't get pets in the building. Uh, the first time we use an IR camera, we don't want to see the little pet trails through our walls. Or even worse, catch them right there 
hanging out in your limb joist. Uh, combustion safety. So if we have our equipment in the conditioned area, we want power vent or direct vent equipment. We're really buying a huge amount of margin uh, in terms of backdrafting safety. Certified fireplaces and stoves that are vented to the outdoors. Again, these are pretty basic, but by using IAP, we're making sure we're doing all those things that make sense for good indoor air quality. A carbon uh, monoxide alarms fall into the same category. These are really just code minimum requirements. This is a key one. Uh, with respect to garage pollutants getting into the house. So if a house is using exhaust-based ventilation for the whole house ventilation, then IAP calls up two different options. Here's one. We can install a garage exhaust fan. It's going to pull air from the garage and expel it to outdoors so it won't go into the home. A uh, fair number of builders are not uh, convinced that's a good investment. Uh, so there, there is a, a second option. If we, again, if we, only if we have a house with an exhaust-based whole house ventilation system, uh, we have these two options. The second of which, when we're running a blower door and the house is plus 50 with respect to outdoors, at that same time, I want to see a pressure difference between the house and the garage of at least plus 45. That's demonstrating we have a good air seal between the house and the garage. And we can feel pretty confident that we're not going to a significant uh, migration of pollutants from the garage into the house. So that's the uh, the IAP provision on the attached garage isolation. Uh, same idea, we want to keep air handlers out of the garage. And then there's low emission product requirements, and these are true for uh, formaldehyde, low formaldehyde pressed wood products and MDF. It's true for our cabinetry. It's true for our paint, low VOC paint. And lastly, we're looking for low VOC carpet padding and adhesive. And I wanted to get to this next slide here. This spells out all the different pathways to finding low emission products that are acceptable under the IAP program. What IAP does is it's pretty rational. They, they reference a lot of different third-party programs that already exist, like CARB labeling, like uh, CRI for Carbon Rug Institute, Green Plus label. Here we see there's a KCMA, that's the Kitchen Cabinet Manufacturers Association. They have a environmental stewardship program for manufacturers that build low-emission cabinets. So it's a lot of alphabet soup trying to find low-emission products if, if you're fairly new to that. Specialty, and we heard that from our builders and their consultants. So the Indoor Air Plus team did a nice job, and they created this fact sheet, sort of like a three or four page cheat sheet on really what to look for, how to source and specify low emission products in each of those categories. Uh, this is, I believe this is a handout today, and it's available on our website as well. So really helpful resource to navigating uh, low emission products. Whole house ventilation is required uh, by Energy Star and therefore by Zero Energy Ready Home. Again, this is a little more than code. Uh, you know, we can go exhaust, we can go balance, we, we can go supply. It follows the ASHRAE 62 2010 airflow rate requirements. And this is just, just a quick sidebar. There's more and more research indicating uh, the persistence of whole house ventilation systems can be pretty suspect. So we build a, a well air sealed home, we put in a ventilation system. Is it really operating and doing it the job we want it to do two years later, three years later? And balance systems and supply systems are particularly prone because they have intakes and stuff like that can happen to their intakes. I'm not even sure what this is. This is not my picture, but if that's your air intake, uh, it's definitely compromised in getting enough air into that ventilation system for the home. So uh, they need to be clean. They need to be accessible. Uh, you can see here that it's a little bit out of reach. So a number of our leading builders are getting much more thoughtful and deliberate about the design of the system so they work long term and handing over uh, maintenance and, and uptake materials to their home buyers. Uh, IAP looks for a, a eight 
MERV filter for the central system in the home. I threw this slide in because I think it's really important. Of course, you want to design for that MERV filter with your duct design. You, you want to know how much uh, pressure drop does that filter represent. And the more you know, the better, because these are all MERV filters. This is a research study done by Davis Energy Group. And you can see here, you know, this MERV filter is maybe 0.28 pressure drop, whereas this one is, is more than double that value. So it speaks to designing the system with the, the actual filter that you're going to use in mind, and ideally handing off some information to homeowners so when they replace that filter six months down the road, uh, they don't swap out this filter for this filter, and then your, your airflow is going to be compromised. Uh, dehumidification is required in warm, humid climates, so basically the southeast, such that we can maintain RH below 60%. To get there, builders can use an additional dehumidification system, or they are allowed to use central HVAC with humidity-based controls uh, that can operate in a dehumidification mode. And this is the area we're talking about down here. But we do talk with a lot of builders in the mixed climates. Uh, just because their homes are so tight, uh, it, the cooling system is not running as often. Uh, enhanced RH control is really recommended even beyond the southeast and in some of these mixed and cold climates. Just about there. This is the sixth building block, the solar ready system. Uh, probably no secret to this group that solar has become much, much more prevalent. Prices are falling. Install capacity is on the rise. So zero energy ready homes, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do a few features for them that make them solar ready. Uh, it's required in the sunniest high solar resources areas of the country. Uh, the provisions we'll look at in a moment are encouraged in these other areas based on your solar resources as spelled out by PV Watt. I'll show you that website in a minute. Uh, that being said, many, many of our partners put in PV ready uh, features uh, whether a program has an absolute requirement for them to do so or not. They like the marketing uh, luster it gives the home, it resonates with homeowners, and they're not uh, high cost items to do. So here's the website. Uh, again, this is in our specs. You go check this out, and based on the zip code, you can find the solar resources on that scale. And if it's five or above, and the PV ready provisions are required. Really important to note, uh, there's some common sense exceptions. If we're building next to tall buildings, tall trees, uh, there's a Utah development which is next to a cliff, uh, which provides a lot of shade. Uh, in those cases, we wouldn't require the PV ready provisions. They might simply not make sense to do. If a project does not have these features, it can still comply with the program. Important point uh, for our partners to understand. The solar ready requirements uh, look like this. Uh, we want to document the load ratings and hand that off to the homeowner so they have that, so it's easier uh, to design the system down the road. Uh, we want to run a conduit from the attic area down to the surface panel area. We want a dedicated area for the system components, such as the inverter. We want a short run conduit from that area over to the panel. And we want a circuit breaker with a dedicated slot or uh, reserved space to tie in uh, the inverter and the PV system. So kind of here's, here, here's back to the 10,000 foot view. Uh, this slide kind of shows where we are compared to other benchmarks. 2012 code over here, here's your HERS. 70 to 80, obviously it's a 2012 enclosure. Energy Star 3.0, we get better building science. Uh, we have independent verification, we have good water management, and we're, we're doing the HVAC uh, with much better practices and quality. Uh, Energy Star 3.1 is basically the same, but as I mentioned, that HERS score is much lower, about 10 points lower, in the mid-50s mid to lower 60s. And then where our program lives is zero ready. Mid-50s for the HERS, that enclosure is going to be 2012 or 15, depending on your state. We have that third-party verifier. We have good water management. We have the, uh, the HVAC quality installation. And then we're doing better with the ducts. 
we're getting them to a, a place where we're, we're happy with them for the long haul. Uh, we have complete indoor air quality, which is really important for our builders to be able to, um, to count on that and use that messaging for their product. Uh, we're putting in efficient components and efficient hot water distribution. The real nice part on the, the water distribution is very few of us, probably few of us on this call, have ever experienced getting hot water in you know, 5, 10, 12 seconds. For most of us, it's a minute, it's two minutes or longer. So homeowners really love that kind of system once they experience it. And then finally, it's solar ready. So it's much easier, more cost effective at home, anticipates adding solar at some point in the future. And take a few more questions. Yeah, hey, everybody. Um, we got some time for some questions here, and I do see the questions piling in. Uh, thanks for sticking around as we went uh, over a little bit. Um, as those questions start piling in, just real quick, uh, for those of you reporting CEUs, make sure to take that survey headed your way. Uh, you'll see an email with some instructions. Check your spam. For those of you watching on demand, make sure to complete that 10-question quiz with the 80% passing rate. Uh, and as the question's coming in, huge thanks to all of our sponsors uh, who allow us to do what we do, Panasonic, Niagara, Sun Intuitive, uh, Build Equinox, and Certainty by St. Gobain, as long, with, as long as all of our members um, who support our work. And uh, this session is approved for um, Certified Passive House Consultant as well. So you will be receiving a code for those of you listening on demand screen capture this page here, you'll need that code and you'll need to head to that link to get your um, CPHC uh, requirements. Okay, so um, I do see some some questions coming in here uh, in regards, going kind of back to the, uh, um, the BEDs and are there certain states that those are required in uh, or is that just a best practice? I'm sorry, Brad, BEDs? Uh, yeah, so we're talking about the, uh, and the acronym escapes me now, but the, um, the in the humid climates where oh, the you had the, the insulated, uh, yeah, duct work. Yeah. Uh, there was a specific question about South Louisiana, but maybe you can just be more, more general for those of you, for those who might have questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we, we use the word bad, but BEDs is probably right too. Uh, it's not required. What, what zero, ready, zero Energy Ready Home requires is that the ducts be in an optimized location. So what I was showing there is a, sort of a toolkit of, of approaches that we see builders use. And it could be building a bulkhead. It could be using an unvented insulated attic and locating the HVAC and the ducts up there. It could be the bed system. Uh, it could be ductless. So the only requirement from the program itself is to locate duct work in an optimized location and our, our spec uh, is to take a look at it, identifies different options like the, the BEDs uh, as eligible approaches. It did, it, it, it did seem like during your session you, or there was a, a reference to something uh, that said in quote, only where installed by builder. Not sure where that specifically was now, but um, do you recall That's, maybe what, what's meant by that? Yeah, I think that's probably referring to the the slide that Energy Star appliances are required only when installed by the builder. So they'll often come up with the uh, clothes washing machine. If, if the builder's not supplying that and, and the home buyer is bringing in their own, uh, the builder obviously can't control control that unit selection and and put in an Energy Star unit. So. Uh, Energy Star appliances are required where they are installed by the builder and provided by the builder. Thank you. Um, what was the uh, the website again uh, for uh, for renewable energy? Um, as far as I believe it was for the uh, I believe the specific question was for the solar the solar ready electrical system specifications. Let me back that up and take you there. I just updated this because NREL maintains the PV watt uh, system and they just reconfigured the site fairly recently so I, they, they changed the website here a little bit. If you, if you just uh, you know, do a web search or Google PV watt, 
uh, you'll end up here in all likelihood. And you can enter your zip. They have a sort of a, a very basic design tool now. You'll enter your zip or a full address. And then it takes you to a, a page with a basic TV system that, um, laid out there for you, and you can toggle it if you choose to. And then you actually have to proceed to the third tab, which says results. And it'll show you how much uh, solar, how many kWh, what value would have for that basic system. It also shows you uh, what, what your solar resources are in kWh per square meter per day for that location. Um, if that turns out to be five or above, that's a location where the PV ready provisions would be required. This map generally holds true. I'm located here in Maryland, so I, I'll plug in different projects here. And we're always around 4.5, 4.6, depending on location. Uh, whereas if you're in the southwest, you'll be you know, 7, 8 or more on the, in terms of that metric. Great, thanks. And I'm going to head back to the uh, FIA slide again for some of those who, who, who may have missed it. Yeah, please. Um, so there are some more specific questions coming in. Um, so if you have some time to stick around, let's maybe drill into a, a few of these, if that's all right, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. So um, can you go over some of the, uh, the zone-specific requirements of the uh, radon system? Maybe you can just briefly back up again and, and describe how, how EPA um, you know, looks into those zone requirements. Yeah, so there's a an EPA radon zone map, which has been, I, I want to say it was developed in the 90s, and it was based on a, a lot of research that was conducted at that point. I'm, I'm not sure how often it's revisited uh, necessarily, but they're broken into one of three zones. So if a given project location is in radon zone one per that map, uh, then radon resistant construction techniques would be required. And we looked at a few of those. It's air sealing the slab, uh, putting in uh, the gravel bed with poly, and then putting a passive stack in. Uh, questions about the evolution of, of the radon zones themselves and any ongoing maintenance of that would probably be better directed to uh, EPA's radon uh, group. And I think they have a radon hotline you can probably find online pretty easily. You know, it's interesting. We um, were assessing some homes in a in a zone uh, three, I think, the least worst one, and um, found a house that was just way off the charts. And the person happened to be a nuclear submarine engineer, so we thought maybe it was emitting from them. We just we still aren't sure yet, but <laughs> um, but but to that point, we did notice um, that we've been hearing a lot of like, lot by lot. Actually, uh, it can change, and so we we are recommending people uh, test and get it tested, or just install the systems, no matter. No matter what zone you're in, it's just a good practice. But I'm not saying it's required for this program. I'm just saying that's the recommendations that we're making. Yeah, absolutely. It's just local conditions and, and awareness of, of radon, higher radon risk, and you're building such tight homes that makes that makes complete sense. Another question uh, coming in, con uh, continuing in our in our health section here. Um, is the uh, requirements for the uh, low um, off-gassing, low VOC applications such as drywall, cabinets, carpet, paint. Just to be sure, those are those are all requirements in the program under Indoor Air Plus, correct? Yes. Yeah, so the, the program requires uh, low emission pressed wood products, um, i.e. MDF products. Many of those will be in the wood structural panels for the sheathing. They will be found in the cabinetry, uh, anything else which is constructed with MDF. Uh, low emission carpet, low emission carpet pads, and low VOC paint. Uh, so that, that rounds out sort of the, the family of product types that are required to be low emission under the Indoor Air Plus program. And our builders, uh, w once they become familiar with the terminology and the third party ratings, uh, I think they've been pretty pleased with being able to locate those, and the, the stockpile of available products is pretty wide and it's growing. Uh, so we, 
we've heard pretty good feedback from our builders, especially once we issued that had a fine document, which kind of cuts through the, uh, the terminology and makes it easier for them to explain to a supplier exactly what they're looking for. Great, thanks. Um, what, uh, last question here before we wrap up, uh, unless there's one more coming in, um, what, uh, what can folks do outside of the U.S.? Uh, this specific question is Europe, but just in general, if they want to follow a program like this, can they, is there any way to get it actually certified outside of the U.S.? Or is there, is there any um, other programs that are similar to it? Uh, this program is, is focused in scope only on U.S. construction. Uh, residential construction. So yeah, unfortunately we we don't look at or consider products or projects uh, outside the U.S. Uh, yeah, I, I have a general awareness of of some of the international programs which are out there. But far from an expert, I I certainly imagine that, that they're out there and they're available. Um, so I, I guess I would encourage you to look at the, uh, the building industry and whatever market you're considering and just doing the research and the energy efficient practices and the third party certification programs which might be available in those locations. Great, Jamie. Well, uh, I appreciate all of your time with you joining us today. Thanks to the Department of Energy for, for having you out here. Uh, just real quick before we wrap up, where can people go to uh, learn more, get more information? Yeah, so this slide that you're looking at here at the, the tail end is the website's over there on the left. Uh, buildings.energy.gov slash zero. And the specs are there, as we mentioned. Uh, a couple of real key points is we've done roughly 25 to 28 uh, webinars, similar to this one, but with subject matter experts in ducts or envelope design. Uh, Dr. Joe Spieber did one on, on high R value assemblies. And, uh, a whole host of topics, and they range like this one, about 60 to 75 minutes. They're all there for remote viewing, if you're interested. Uh, there's a marketing toolkit for our partners to help help them communicate the value of these homes. And this fourth bullet, the Tour Zero, it's, a, it's an online tour of certified projects from this program, very, very consumer friendly, uh, intended to really distinguish the projects and the builders behind those projects. Uh, so it walks you through a lot of pictures of the site, has a testimonial from the homeowner normally about what, what it's like to have a house like that. Uh, and we're adding to that each year. Uh, there's 60, 70, 80 homes on there now and you can sort by location um, to go check out homes that might interest you. So it's not a really nice resource available. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Take care. All right. Thanks so much, Brett. Thank you, everyone.